Good morning, Calgary family and friends. My name is Kayla Madison, and it's my pleasure this morning to present to you a review of Aretha Franklin and her accomplishments as a prominent African-American woman, whose roots and beginnings were right here in Buffalo. Yes, Aretha began in Buffalo's Friendship Baptist Church. Her legacy actually began on Buffalo's east side. The Queen of Soul grew up at 179 Glenwood Avenue after her family moved there from Memphis, Tennessee. Her mother, Barbara, was a nurse at the Buffalo General Hospital and her father was a pastor at Friendship Baptist Church. They left Buffalo in 1948. Her parents then separated and her mother moved back to Buffalo. Aretha would come back for summer visits. After her mother's death, she would come to visit her grave at Forest Glen Cemetery. She became a star despite having a child at an early age, followed by three more sons, being a bad wife, and having an up and down career. Her talent ranged from gospel to blues to jazz. Though many tried, Patti LaBelle, Glenda Knight, Natalie Cole, Chaka Khan, Whitney Houston, and even Beyonce, no one has equaled her talent. The Obamas have said that she helped to define America. Her singing of Precious Lord, Take My Hand, actually brought the Obamas to tears. Even the Beatles stated that she was the best singer that this country has ever produced, and Buffalo had a part in that. At age 14, her first album was called Song of Faith. She performed at a Martin Luther King tribute at Madison Square Garden in 1968 and many, many more events. We remember her for her song Respect, which stayed in many ways to define her. Aretha died on August 16th without a will and is buried at the Wooden Lawn Cemetery in Detroit. She is remembered for the many musical accomplishments, but should also be credited for being a role model to African-American women and girls in today's world. They should see that poverty, depression, single parent families, one race or gender should never hold them back. Aretha Franklin, we thank you. I open my mouth unto the Lord and I won't turn back. I will go, I shall go to see what the end is going to be.
is now bowed, every eye is closed as we now prepare for this yet another moment in worship. God, we thank you today for all that you've done for us, and we thank you, God, for all that you have blessed us with. But above all, God, we thank you today just for who you are, for you are indeed a mighty good God. We thank you for allowing us to make it through last week and allowing us, God, to come into this moment to see the start of a brand new week. And so we pray right now, God, that during this time of worship, that, God, you would free us up, that we, oh God, would worship you in spirit and in truth, that, God, you would block out every distraction that would hinder our worship and hinder our praise. More importantly, God, we pray that this moment in worship will be a transformative one and that, God, you would speak to us as only you can. For this is our prayer today, and we pray this prayer in your son Jesus' name. And all of God's people said amen and amen. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Certainly this is the day that the Lord has made, and we all ought to rejoice and be glad in it. If you are excited to be alive and in the number one more time, why don't you go ahead and put your hands together right where you are. Go ahead, right where you are, just put your hands together in the virtual space. Right now, whether you're joining us via our Facebook Live, if you're joining us via YouTube, even on the conference call line, wherever you're joining us from, you ought to praise the name of the Lord because God is indeed great and greatly to be praised. We also want to thank God for all of our first time and even returning guests who are joining us on this Sunday morning. We don't take your presence virtually for granted. And we want to let you know that we want to remain connected with you. We want to know who you are and where you are worshiping from in our virtual sanctuary. And so we would ask that you would just send us at this time in the comment section or even in our direct messenger. Just go ahead right where you are and just send us uh, your name and where you're worshiping from. Uh, if you would like to include additional information, we would ask that you would do so as well so that, again, we can not only remain connected with you in this season, but that we may also remain connected with you in the seasons ahead. And we want to let you know 
that again, not only are we grateful, but uh, we also want to let you know that we pray that you would even share this time with someone else. And at this time, though we're unable to give you a physical one, we give you a huge cyber hug this morning, a cyber handshake, a cyber hug, a fist bump handshake. Uh, we just want to send emojis your way. We just want to let you know that again, we're so grateful to God for you. And all of God's people said, amen. At this particular time, it is time for us to now go before the throne of grace and to have a little talk with Jesus. Somebody today is just grateful for the wonderful privilege that we yet have to pray unto the Lord, that even when you aren't able to converse with friends because they're busy or you're unable to converse with family members because they're nowhere to be found, Oh, it is such a blessing to know that we can yet converse with the Lord and the Lord is never busy, too busy for us. Today we want to keep in prayer all of uh, those individuals who yet find themselves during this time of bereavement, all of those individuals who are yet grieving. Just last week, uh, we had two families in particular connected with Calvary, three families, uh, should I say, connected with Calvary, uh, who uh, saw loved ones to transition and who celebrated uh, their loved ones' lives. And so we want to keep uh, Sister Diana McKenzie lifted up in prayer as uh, we eulogized her son just this past Thursday, Brother Dwayne McKenzie. We also want to keep uh, the family, the Young family, lifted up in prayer as Sister Linda Young's sister-in-law, Sister Marjorie Young, uh, went on to be with the Lord. We also want to keep the family of Brother Jake Watkins lifted up in prayer as his nephew, uh, Brother Antoine uh, Watkins, went on to be with the Lord. Uh, we want to keep not only all of those families lifted, but we want to keep all of those individuals who find themselves in this period of bereavement lifted up. We also want to keep lifted up at this time all of those individuals who are experiencing health challenges, all of those who are preparing to undergo uh, procedures, all of those who are recovering from procedures. We want to continue to not only keep them in prayer, but we want them to know that, again, God's hand of mercy is still on their lives. And so whatever, uh, whoever's name it is that now rests upon your heart, we ask again that you would submit those so that we might not only pray in this time and in this setting, but that we might also continue to call those names up in our own personal and private time of devotion. Let us now look unto the Lord. Eternal and everlasting God, we thank you today for the fact that you are God. And God, beside you, there is no other. We thank you, God, that when we call upon others and they're unresponsive, that God, you never turn your ear away from us. But God, you always are there to hear your children. And for that, God, we say thank you today. Thank you, God, that in our deepest, darkest moments of despair, in our time of hurt, our time of anguish, God, you're right there to know exactly what it is that we stand in the need of. And although, oh God, you may not supply us with those things right away, we're so grateful today to know and to serve an on-time God. A God who steps in and a God who intervenes just when we need you most. And so as we've gathered here this morning, God, there are individuals who have come saying that it's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so God, whatever it is that my brother, that my sister stands in need of today, we pray, oh God, that you would meet them at that point and their place of need. Whether, oh God, it's 
a physical ailment, whether it's some mental issue, God, whether it's a matter of them wrestling financially with trying to come up with resources in order to make it. God, we thank you that, God, you will even provide even right now. We thank you, O oh God, that you are indeed still Jehovah Jireh. God, we thank you today that you're still sheltering us from the hurt, harm, and danger that comes our way. And even, oh God, when the enemy tries to form plans and tactics against us, oh God, we're just so grateful that you continue to show that your word is yet true and that no weapon that, are, that is formed against us will be able to prosper. And so God, for that person right now who's battling with COVID, that person right now who's in that place of grief, for that person right now who finds themselves just trying to discern where it is that you would have them to go next. God, we pray that you would lead them according to your will. Because God, we know that if you lead us, we will not go astray. If you lead us, oh God, you will lead us to those places that you desire and have for us. So God, just continue to be our guide and continue to be with us. And we'll be ever so mindful, God, to give your name all the praise, honor, and glory. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said amen and praise God.
Amen. Every praise indeed belongs to our God. Thank you so very kindly to those who have done such a marvelous job this morning of leading us in worship. Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41 is where I invite your attention this morning as we continue in our sermonic series, Dream Again. A thought that is not only the driving force of this sermon series, but also our thematic thrust here at Calvary for 2021. And so again, Genesis chapter 41, beginning at verse 25. From the New Revised Standard Version of the Holy Writ, you'll find these words, both written and recorded. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, as are the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. Verse number 28, it is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The grass withers and the flowers do fade. But the word of our God shall indeed stand forever. For the time that is ours to share in this next installment of our sermonic series, Dream Again, I want to use for a thought simply watching and waiting. Watching and waiting. You ought to type that right now where you are. Don't wait, don't watch. Just type in watching and waiting. Watch it, watching and waiting. I don't know what it is, Sister Benton, but as of late, I've had these moments when I found myself just reminiscing over the time that I served as an elementary school teacher. And I know what some of you are probably thinking and even saying to yourself that Perhaps deep down on the inside, perhaps subconsciously, I may uh, miss and desire to go back into the classroom. Let me assure you now that not only do I not ascribe to that notion, but I don't think that that is the case, especially during this climate in which I must tip my hat to all of those educators who yet educate our young people in this virtual space. So I don't know if it's a matter of missing the classroom as much as it might be a matter of missing the little ones and the lessons that they taught me along the way. Because as any good educator knows, the teaching and learning experience doesn't just happen with the curriculum that the educator presents to the student. But you also glean some helpful tips and helpful lessons along the way from the student. Most of the times, as a matter of fact, the lessons that I learned were not always from what the child or the students would say, as much as it is what they would do, how they would behave, and how they even responded to certain situations. Take, for example, if you will, when I would have to sit a child out during recess because either they didn't complete a particular assignment or because of the disruption that they caused during instructional time. Some of you are having flashbacks yourself to your own childhood. It may not seem like much having to sit out from recess but to a nine and 10 year old boy and girl, this was a complete disruption to their day. 
to take away something that they longed for all day, that many of them had even dreamed about all day long. For many of them, that was cruel and unusual punishment. And if a child couldn't participate in recess, I wouldn't keep them indoors, no, but I would allow them to go outside so that they too could have a bit of fresh air. And when they went outside, the only thing that they could do was watch and wait as they looked at their peers and as I did what Auntie Maxine would call reclaim my time. And so the only thing, again, that they could do is stand off to the distance, but it was very interesting to watch how different students would respond to this moment. Some would pass the time by by expressing their discontentment and their anger and their frustration with me. Some would begin to strategize how they could possibly make up the time in other areas, such as doing something around the classroom, but having their time given back to them. Some would just sit and just watch and just wait, which made those minutes seem more like hours. But every now and again, there were those who wouldn't just sit and just merely watch their peers and wait for their time to come. But there were those who would opt to participate in doing work. That is, they would bring down an assignment, either the one they hadn't completed or another assignment that was due. And while they would wait, while they would watch as their peers enjoyed their time and their peers engaged in recreational activity. These students who would bring those assignments down, who would bring down their pencils, instead of just becoming upset with this process of having to watch their peers and having to wait until their moment again came, they would opt to do something that helped me, and that is they would opt to engage in work. And we've seen, my brothers and sisters, throughout our exploration of these past few chapters, this same example modeled in the life of Joseph. As Joseph had dreamed a dream, but yet Joseph had to watch and wait until that dream came to pass. And instead of just merely watching and waiting the time to go by for his dream to come true, Joseph, too, opted to engage in work. He was working. He continued to remain diligent. He continued to remain in what we can see from what is written in the Holy Writ in a positive spirit and in a positive light. But we can only imagine that at some point, along with just watching and waiting, Joseph perhaps, as he even engaged in the work, became a bit worried. Worried as to whether or not his dreams would be fulfilled. Even as he watched, others around them have their dreams fulfilled whether it had a favorable outcome or not. And so it is that we see when we pick up in chapter 41 that it had been two years or more since Joseph was in prison at this time. Life was passing Joseph by. So too were his dreams. Meanwhile, as I've already mentioned, the dreams of others just continued to flow. They just continued to unfold all around him. And even as we see here, even in the life of the Egyptian leader, the one who held the most power within the land, that of Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh had two dreams during this particular time. 
two dreams that had clear resemblances and meanings that neither he nor his trained officials could interpret. We learn of these two dreams in verses 1 through 7. And just giving you the cliff note version of it, in the first dream, Pharaoh is positioned near the Nile River. Now don't miss this setting. Don't miss where he is now positioned. Don't miss this site where he is because it is no accident or coincidence that he's located in the Nile because the Nile had economic and cultural implications. It was the Nile that was considered Egypt's lifeline because of what happened during its annual flooding period. And typically, whenever we talk about flooding, or as they would even consider it here, inundation, typically flooding doesn't have a positive connotation because of the damage that it causes. However, in this instance, the water from the annual flood wouldn't jeopardize the lives of those who resided within Egypt, but instead it assisted their living. How is that so? Well, the annual flooding would increase the fertilization of the rich black soil, which led to an increase in the trade market as well as the transportation industries, amongst other things. And by providing these gifts, if you will, to Egypt, this flooding also received its nickname, the Gifts of the Nile. Because without these particular gifts, Egypt's survival rate would have decreased substantially. So it is to no surprise that the context not only spoke to Pharaoh's survival, but it also spoke to the survival of the people and those whom he had leadership over. Standing in the Nile in this dream, there were seven sleek and fat cows coming up out of the Nile that began to graze the ground. The seven cows classified then appeared as ugly and thin, and when they appeared, they ate and devoured the fatted cows. This was the first dream that Pharaoh had. And in the second dream, seven plump and good ears of grain grew up on one stalk. The seven ears of grain that were thin and scorched by the hot, deserted wind then sprouted up right after. And they began to latch on to the same stock and devour the healthy ones. And like the chief cupbearer who we saw in chapter 40 and the baker, Pharaoh, after having these dreams, found himself in a place in which he was both disturbed and perplexed. But unlike the chief cupbearer and the baker who were in prison, Pharaoh was a man of means. He was not only a man of means, but he was one who had individuals and resources at his disposal who should have been able to interpret the meaning of this dream successfully. However, as it is then later recorded, no one, not even the magicians who weren't magicians in today's sense, but that was an Egyptian term used for an officer of Pharaoh's court who specialized in engraving. They weren't able to do so because you do realize, my brother, and you do realize, my sister, that sometimes access and resources aren't enough when God has a greater plan that God has in motion. And so word begins to travel throughout Pharaoh's court where it eventually lands on the ear of a very familiar person whom we've seen in just the previous chapter. And I just mentioned it falls on the ear of the cupbearer. And when the cupbearer receives this information, this same one who had forgotten about Joseph, not two days prior or two weeks prior or two months prior, but two years or more prior, when it finally lands on his ears and he hears about the distress caused in the life of Pharaoh, he then begins to think about his own experience. He then begins to think about what Joseph had done for him. 
and he then recommends Joseph to be brought before Pharaoh. Put a pen there. We'll come back to that momentarily. And so once again, Joseph is placed in a rather peculiar position in which he must help other people understand their dreams while he himself has to wrestle with the confusion of his own. Confusion in the sense of being placed in a setting with others who are dreaming, but yet he has his dreams on pause. Confusion in the sense of others are being set free and liberated, but he's still in bondage, serving as a prisoner. He has to wrestle with the confusion of his own dreams and where his dreams are in the sense of being placed before royalty and other people of power and prestige, but yet he's still a prisoner and a foreigner whom if they didn't have any use for him, perhaps these individuals wouldn't even engage with Joseph. Confusion in the sense that he now has to sit back, watch, and wait for his dreams to gain some type of meaning while he's engaged in a work that calls for him to help others understand dreams of their own. And in looking at this, some would suggest that it just doesn't make sense. For some of us who would even place ourselves in Joseph's shoes, if we were in this type of situation, instead of helping people gain a sense of understanding of their dreams, we would have felt some type of way. We would have wondered why it is that their dreams we can understand and their dreams are coming to pass, but yet our dreams we don't understand. And our dreams have left us in a place like Joseph where we simply are in a place of imprisonment. Some would have wondered, when will my dreams begin to take shape? When will I get my break in life? When will mishap after mishap eventually start missing me? And perhaps today you understand this. What it's like to have to sit back and watch and wait as you see other people's dreams, other people's goals unfold and your dreams, your goals, your calling seems to have remained shut. It's a very difficult place even to find yourself when you look around at other people and you wonder when your life will begin to experience some type of forward movement. Instead of always feeling stuck and stagnant all the time. And sometimes life will put us in rather precarious places where we will even doubt as to whether or not our dreams will amount to anything because it seems that we do more waiting and watching than we do seeing our dreams unfold. To have to sit on the sidelines and watch other people's dreams unfold before your eyes can be rather difficult. Watching and waiting for a move of God to happen, but yet nothing seems to happen for you. Nothing seems to go your way. Way. Nothing in your life appears to align according to the direction that you know God has called you to go. 
but I don't know who needs to hear this today, but hear me well. Don't allow what has happened in your life, what hasn't happened in your life yet, to prevent you from experience what God is about to do. Allow me to say that one more time. Don't allow what hasn't happened yet. Somebody ought to type yet in the comment section right now. Don't, don't allow what hasn't happened in your life yet to prevent you from experiencing what God is about to do. Because God has a way of orchestrating our stagnation and our feelings of being stuck together in such a way that you may not realize it now, but God is able to orchestrate those things in such a way that he will arrange them into a beautiful symphony that others will eventually hear. Oh yeah, sure, it's difficult now. Sure, my brother, sure, my sister, it's confusing now. Sure, you don't understand what God is up to at this very moment now. Sure, you can't see the final product now. But like the life of Joseph, our lives, particularly those of us who are believers, aren't set up to be structured that way whereby we won't experience moments of difficulty, whereby we won't experience moments of confusion, whereby we won't always understand what God is up to in our lives. That's why the Lord has already declared that my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And unfortunately, I would submit today that the true testing of your dreams and the true testing of who you are overall as a believer is not found in the way in which you maneuver life after your dreams have been manifested, but how you manage life while those dreams are still in their molding process. And sometimes it will involve you not only waiting and watching as others have their dreams realized. But sometimes it will cause you to have to work to help them in their own process. Oh, that's not easy to, to offer up your help in advancing their dreams forward and yours don't appear to go anywhere. But child of God, sometimes that's the position the Lord puts us in. And it's a very unsettling, it's a very uncomfortable position to find yourself in if you're fully honest and transparent. I mean, just think about it. You have people right now asking for your advice and asking uh, for your contribution on wedding colors and concepts and asking you to be a part of their special day when in your mind you're still trying to figure out when you're going to tie the knot when you're going to start a family of your own, when you're going to purchase and own your own home, when your life will experience peace, when your life will show some evidence of progress, when, when will you get out of your rut that you've been in not for a few days or months, but years. When, when will you achieve what God desires next for your life? When will you get past what seems like the never-ending stages of grief? When will you move out of that depressive state and walk in the dreams that have been outlined for you? But oh, my brother, oh, my sister, 
what we learn from Joseph in this instance, as he's watching and waiting, what we learn from Joseph and the grace of the text this morning is while we're in our own seasons, in our own periods of waiting and watching, not only will God gift us with the necessary strength and the necessary tools and the wherewithal to keep on working, but what Joseph shows us today is that more importantly, God will continue to work on our behalf. That God just won't give us the strength to get up in the morning and the strength to get ourselves in a position where we keep on working, but God will continue to work on our behalf. Oh, I know it's true that God will indeed help us to see that if we don't get weary along the way in doing good, God will show us that God has something greater in store for us. We, we may not know what it is, but God indeed has something greater for us, even as we are doing good. Joseph is placed in a position where he's constantly being used to help others understand and realize their dreams. But watch this, in the process, watch the posture that Joseph takes. Joseph never once impedes on their progress. Just because his dreams didn't seem to have any traction, Joseph doesn't block. Joseph doesn't manipulate, nor does Joseph impede on the progress of other people's dreams for the sake of his own. What am I talking about? Joseph never puts himself in a position whereby he informs others that he will not help them interpret their dreams. Joseph never once sabotages their dreams by providing a false interpretation because Joseph had a way of understanding that this gift that he had was a gift from God. That's why he said even previously in that eighth verse of chapter 40 that do not interpretations belong to God. And so while Joseph is still hanging on, to hope that the Lord will see to it that his dreams would unfold according to the Lord's divine and perfect timing, Joseph still managed to help others not only see their dreams, but Joseph helped others to process their dreams. Joseph helped others to realize where their dreams were taking them. And for his diligence, for his faithfulness in the process to the work he was already engaged in, while he watched, while he waited, the Lord saw to it that Joseph was remembered for his reputation. Somebody ought to type that right now. Remembered for his reputation. Joseph did not have to come out of character in order for people to come see about him. Joseph did not have to come out of his character in order for the Lord to provide for him. Him. Joseph did not have to diminish his faithful witness for the sake of his future advancement. But instead, Joseph was remembered for his reputation. He wasn't forgotten. He was remembered for his reputation by an unlikely source in that of the chief cupbearer, who in verse number nine said, I remembered my faults 
when he starts to recount his time in prison. And he begins to say, when I had this dream, there was a young Hebrew. <laughs> he may not have remembered his name, but he remembered his ethnicity. There, there was a young Hebrew who served as captain of the guard. And, and it was this young Hebrew that helped to interpret my dream. And, and in verse 14, it says that Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was hurriedly brought out of the dungeon, brought out of the prison. And we then shaved himself and changed his clothes and came before Pharaoh because he was remembered by his reputation. It was his character. It was his integrity that got him to that place where he could shave. <laughs> where he could change the clothes that he wore in the prison and he could move to the palace and stand before Pharaoh. And again, he didn't have to manipulate his way into that position. He didn't have to try to con his way into that position. He didn't have to try to fight or plead his case, but all Joseph had to do was remain faithful maintain that good reputation, and he was remembered. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I tell you that not only was he remembered for his reputation, but because of his ability to work while watching and waiting, God was working on his behalf to the point where he was even offered an opportunity of a lifetime. That's what God will do. He'll, he'll offer you opportunities that you may not have even qualified for simply because of your faithfulness. See, because at this time, those persons who had the credentials to interpret dreams, they couldn't do it for Pharaoh. Those individuals who were a part of Pharaoh's court who had the qualifications to interpret dreams. They couldn't interpret them for Pharaoh. But Pharaoh had to go to the prison. And Pharaoh had to get Joseph, bring him before him, and offer him an opportunity. And as he offers this opportunity, he starts to tell Joseph that dream in verse number 15. He tells them of this dream, and he says that there's no one that can interpret it, but I've heard of you. Here's that reputation again. He says, I, I have heard it said that, that you are the one who can hear dreams and interpret them. But oh, again, Joseph says, even though I've been offered this opportunity, oh, you must understand that it's not I. <laughs> That's what he says in verse 16. It's, it's not I, but God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. He, he, he says, even as I stand here with an opportunity, this opportunity that I've been afforded is not because of what I have done. Oh, I've remained faithful. I've remained diligent. But, but this opportunity that I've been afforded and I've been offered has been because of the Lord. And the same God who placed it upon the chief cupbearer's heart to remember me is the same God that called for you to call for me, and is the same God that will look favorably upon you. This was hard for Pharaoh to understand, because even as he gives Joseph this shot, even as he outlines what's happening or what happened in his dream, you can even hear the despondence in the way in which he recounts it. Those thin and ugly cows, they become poor, very ugly and thin, which showed again that 
his mind was already at a place where he just knew this dream would not have a favorable outcome. But Joseph said, even as you offer me this opportunity, I want you to know that God will give you a favorable answer. And Joseph, even while he's in a place of watching and waiting, he does something very critical, which is what I'll leave you with today, in that Joseph also puts together a plan. Joseph's remembered for his reputation during this time. He's offered an opportunity, but Joseph says, I'm not just going to help you understand this dream, but I'm going to help you to put together a plan. And in verses 25 through verses 35, we see, 36, we see whereby Joseph interprets the dream. He says that those seven cows that were nice and fit, those seven cows that first came out of the Nile represented seven good years, as did those seven good ears of grain. He then goes on to say that those thin and ugly cows, as well as those burnt Sources of grain represented seven years in which a famine would come over Egypt. Joseph helped him to realize and helped him to understand the dream. But, but Joseph says that after all of this, here's the plan, Pharaoh. Here, here's what you need to do, Pharaoh. Verse 33, he goes on to say, Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a man who is discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of the good years that are coming and lay up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to befall the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through famine. Joseph says, I'm not only going to help you to realize your dreams, but, but I'm going to put together this plan so that not only are you in a good place, Pharaoh, but I'm going to put together this plan so that the entire land may not perish. And could it be, my brothers and sisters, that that's the place where God is trying to lead both you and I. That maybe, just maybe, that's what God is trying to bring out of each and every one of us who have found ourselves in places where we've had to watch and wait. Maybe that's the area that God desires us to mature in. Maybe that's the area God desires for us to bloom in. Maybe the seasons of watching and waiting in our lives that we find ourselves in are for us to mature to the point where not only are we able to cheer for our brothers and sisters as we see their dreams unfolding, but could it be that God is trying to mature us to the place where we work to help them see those dreams even begin to move forward? Could it be that the Lord is trying to put us in position while we're waiting and while we're watching to help our fellow brothers and sisters gain insight into what those dreams mean while in the process he's cultivating, he's working on us so that we can gain insight into the value 
of working hard to see to it that our own dreams are realized. I don't know today, my brother, I don't know today, my sister, how stressful this season has been for you. I don't know today, my brother, I don't know today, my sister, what thoughts you've been contemplating that have almost caused you to step out of your character, but, but don't you lose your character, don't you lose your integrity during your periods of watching and waiting others dream their dreams. Because in God's timing, guess what? You'll be shown that you'll be remembered for your reputation. I know right now you're trying to figure out when the Lord will make room and make space for you to go through that next door into the next season of your life. But just know that the Lord will put things in place where the right offer for the right opportunity, it will come along while you wait, while you work, while you watch. So in the meantime, keep putting together that plan. Keep, keep working out that plan. Don't, don't, don't give up on your hard work towards that plan. Don't, don't give up on dreaming. Don't, don't give up on just settling for life as it is now. Because God, in those periods of waiting, God has a way of doing something awesome in our lives. There were those who even had to wait to see their dreams come to reality. Those who are part of our rich ancestry, they didn't waver, they, they continued to work. And even though right now, they may not be around to see and to reap the benefits of the work that they've put in, through the plan that they've crafted, they crafted. I want to tell you today that watching and waiting isn't a bad thing because we know that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, mount up with wings as eagles, run, not be weary, walk, and not faint. And all of God's people said, amen. This time we want to invite and encourage somebody who too has been watching and waiting for the right opportunity to say yes unto the Lord. We want to invite you to now engage in the work of coming forward and saying yes to the Lord. Oh, as we've already seen, my brother, as we've already seen, my sister, the work of salvation was already done on our behalf. And now all you have to do is just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. And you will indeed be saved. Perhaps as you have even watched us and have been waiting to make the decision to connect with this community known as Calvary. We want to let you know that today is a good day to say yes. Perhaps you've been watching and you've been waiting to just come back into the fold. Don't put it off another day. Today is a great day to say yes. So you can go ahead right now at this time and send us a direct message within our messenger. You can also go to our website and under the contact us section, you can send us a note and let us know that either you desire to be baptized or you desire just to connect with a community of faith who not only reads the word of God and studies the word of God, 
but a body of believers who believe in the word of God. But we believe today that if you've just said yes, that you are indeed saved. And all of God's people rejoice with the angels above for those who will make the decision by saying amen. Amen. We're just certainly grateful today for the word of God and how the word of God continues to help us to make it even during our seasons of waiting and watching. As we continue now to even move forward in this time of worship, we want to worship God through our giving. As I mentioned this past Tuesday, and again, I want to thank God for all of those who were a part of our 2021 church conference. God has blessed us richly. God has blessed us far beyond what any of us could have imagined in this season. And I just believe that there are individuals who are committed to keep working in this season of watching and waiting to get back into the physical space, who will continue to contribute faithfully to the work of ministry. And so as always, there are three ways in which you can give. First and foremost, you can give by way of Givelify. Simply download that app. And after downloading the app Givelify, it will walk you through those safe and easy steps to give. You can also give by going online to our website, going there to the home screen and clicking give. Or if you just desire to come in on Tuesdays, which many of you have, and we're so grateful to God for you. We invite and we encourage you to contribute even on Tuesdays between nine and noon. But whatever way in which the Lord places upon your heart to give to the work of ministry, we want to let you know that ministry is still going forth here at Calvary. And we thank you in advance for your ability to remain faithful to the tithe and your ability to go above and beyond through that of your offering. Again, my brothers, again, my sisters, we just thank God for this day. Uh, thank God for all of those who took part in our 21-day uh, fasting, uh, 21 days of fasting and praying. Uh, tonight, as you celebrate uh, with that special somebody, uh, you can do so over a meal, uh, have some chicken or, or have a nice steak, whatever it is that you desire. But I pray that more than a dietary decision, I pray that during this time you were able to draw even closer unto the Lord uh, during this time of 21 days of fasting and praying. And I pray that it's even created a level of a routine whereby now you will continue to pray unto the Lord in a very intentional manner. Uh, as a reminder, this Wednesday we will gather at 6.30 p.m., but we will gather for our virtual Ash Wednesday um, worship service as we begin the Lenten season. Uh, we will then resume our uh, final installment of Caught in the Acts next Wednesday. And then the first Wednesday in March, we will begin our new series uh, entitled, uh, what is it? Change Attitudes. Change Attitudes. That's it. <laughs> Change Attitude. All right. And so check your attitude. I knew it was there. Check your attitude. And so again, we pray that you will join us for that experience. And then on next Sunday, we will have our Heritage Sunday. We will have our Heritage Sunday next Sunday, uh, where we have none other than Dr. William Marcus Small, uh, pastor of the New Calvary uh, Baptist Church of Norfolk, Virginia. He will join us virtually. And so I pray that you too uh, will be a part of that. I know that we're accustomed to donning our African attire. Go ahead and wake up in that morning and do so. We're also encouraging people to take a selfie on that Sunday and just go ahead and uh, type in Heritage Sunday. Amen. And so we want you to be a part of that experience next week. Finally, again, those who are celebrating their anniversaries, wedding anniversaries for the month of February, we thank you 
and we celebrate God for you. We would ask that you would submit those dates. And even if you just so dare to desire to submit uh, how many years you and your uh, significant other have been married, we would ask that you would do so at this time. But we're praying that next year will certainly be a blessed one. Shall we now look unto the Lord and now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. And all of God's people said amen and praise God.